Great. Okay. Well, good morning, good afternoon in the US. Good morning, in Spain. These days, good morning. Um, well, um, thank you for this kind presentation of myself. Um, I have all the awful things in a speaker. Uh, I usually speak loud, I usually speak fast. I, usually, I have a terrible English, and I am so. And if you don't understand anything or you need it to me and speak up or whatever, just tell me. Don't be shy. I'm not going to be uh, so whatever. But I'm going to present a, a project, a small project, very humble project that uh, I'm uh, most proud of. I have ever done in my life. It's uh, about uh, centenarians, and I'm going to start the presentation like uh, at the end. So thank you. <laughs> Why thank you? Well, thank you for letting me stay here in the department for these three months. Uh, as my colleague told us, uh, I was here 10 years ago, so it's good to be here after 10 years. Oh, we have we have changed. Uh, I think uh, this uh, building hasn't changed. I was, uh, first time I was there in, in this uh, stage. Yeah, I smell the I smell the you know the, this, uh, the smell of the, of the building. It hasn't changed. But, <laughs> and thank you all the department for giving me the space and this one sign. I'm sorry I apologize because I didn't meet you. And if I only have some few master experience, because summer is summer and <laughs> July was kind of empty. So far, one day, I think that's enough. And congrats, congrats for your anniversaries. And congrats to the building, 110 years, a super centenarian building. Um, <laughs> congrats to Ron, uh, Ken, and and John for the rest of the year, 30 years and 40 years in the department. I congrats to all the women because it's been like 150 years they could uh, stay at the uh, study at, at Berkeley. I think it's, uh, Jenna told us in a uh, long email. Well, I would like to start with when uh, I was here 10 years ago. I have many memories of that space. I have many memories, and almost all of them are good. Uh, very good, actually. I was very happy here. We were like four months. But I was I, I was to stay here like, uh, doing the master of demography, do the PhD. But I couldn't, as I had to come back to Spain. But all almost all of them are, are good, good memories. But maybe those memories are kind of being kind of blurry because it's been 10 years. Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe my memories are well. No, they are, I don't know if they are better than they, they was or they are worse than they were. I know, just yes, about example, the other day was the first game of the birth. Um, I, remember, I remember last time it was like a good big party, all the people making barbecues in the parking lot, uh, fraternity with the uh, Fred and Bloom, cats and like throwing the beer on the <laughs> chest. It was very crazy. Uh, it's a real memory or it's just the memory I have and maybe it wasn't because in 2019 it wasn't so crazy. It was very quiet, no barbecues, mm -hmm. uh, all the people uh, drinking water, what happened? <laughs> Maybe 10 years ago, that memory was, of that, 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 that situation was like uh, three or four days ago. And I have this memory like much better than it was. But it's only 10 years ago. What happened? And actually, I'm not sure, just a minute, and just, this was me 10 years ago. So that time goes by for everyone. Uh, it's not a mountain, this is true, it's me. Uh, I, with the whole family to watch, uh, to the friend, and, and you know, I have now gray hair, and I'm um, uh, you know, uh, cross eyes, uh, off the eyes, you know, time passes. It's, that's a uh, law of life. And uh, here with uh, Emilio, well, I, yes, 
I just want to show, uh, I, I just want to show the, the, these pictures because it's been the years, sorry, I'm repeating that, but for example, for Perfecta, here she is when she was 29 in 1948, and she's looking at herself 70 years later. So what is she thinking about her when she turned 100 years old? And what, I was wondering, what thinks Perfecta with 100 about herself? What are the memories about their life during all these life books? That is the, the, um, the beginning of, of this, uh, this project. I was wondering about that. What centenarian people think about their lives when their memories at this time of change in their heads? So, um, at the beginning, I started by myself, only me, with a very, very big budget of zero euros. So it was kind of difficult, uh, but then we, we found some, some, some grants. And, uh, I, I started only by myself at the University of Paulo de la Vida, and now we are five universities involved in this project, things like two or three months ago. And, 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 and. We, we were like uh, in the mirror of the big, big projects of centenarians in the, the, the theory of centenarian study, the New England centenarian study in the US, and in the Europe, this one, the 100 plus study in the, in the Netherlands. This one are big, big projects with, uh, I don't know, 50, 60 people involved in them, uh, many perspective, mainly genetical thing. Uh, so, what do we do? So we try to, we, I mean we because we, I started with uh, three students, undergrad students, uh, who were doing an internship with me. And we tried to set up a, a small objective. And our original objective was to study the emotional health of centenarians. That's what, that, that is what uh, I was telling you. At, uh, what think centenarians about their life courses and what thing what think the centenarians about uh, their own longevity when they reach 100 years old. So we design a cross-sectional study, essentially qualitative, I, I'm the end of in statistics, uh, demography, PhD in sociology and demography, I've been working all my life with database, but I wanted to like, change the perspective. Uh, so we designed the qualitative uh, research with um, biographical interviews. So far we have um, 23 centenarians interviewed and they were born between 1910 and 19, uh, uh, 19. Um, I'm going to go later with this. So main objective to, uh, to, to, to fix the, uh, to analyze social and emotional aspects of well-being of centenarian population and, and, and the goal to understand what it means for them to turn 100 years old. Well, uh, we carried out the, uh, the, the project first in Seville and then in Salamanca, where I was starting actually. Um, I don't know if you know where Seville and Salamanca are, or Seville is in the south of Spain. Uh, it's one of the uh, provinces, provinces with uh, less high uh, life expectancy in Spain. Uh, Pure Health, uh, one of the tourist. Uh, uh, and Salamanca is in uh, central Spain. Well, so, uh, Sevilla, I, mean, I, I, I would like to say, has two million of inhabitants, and it's mostly urban. And Salamanca is in only 350,000 inhabitants, mostly rural, and it's one of the best performing life expectancy, the second one in Spain, like 87, or 80, almost 88 for. for for women, kind of remarkable. And according to the civil register, in Seville, there are uh, 250 centenarians in 2018, 13 per 100 something, and in Salamanca, there are like four times centenarians in Seville, in relative terms. So it's good to compare this uh, so different, so, so different, such a different. Provinces in Spain 
and it's what we are going to show you. It was the, the population, so I told you it was 20,017, it's the same. It's like the 250 centenarians in Spain, but we have, oh, we, we, set, we set up three, three inclusion criteria. First one is clear, it could be 100 years old, it's clear. And because they are gonna be interviewed, we decided that obviously they have to be in good cognitive conditions. So it's not so easy to find a centenarian with fully cognitively functional. And what about the physical conditions? Uh, any, it doesn't matter, but uh, we perform a test to check if they were deaf, uh, well, actually a way, a doctor and a nurse. Um, with, uh, we did the interview only if they were like under 75% deafness with an assistant. So finally, uh, of these 250 centenarians, according to the studies of the regional government of Andalusia, um, kind of 35% of them fit in the inclusion criteria. That means uh, like 100. So 100 people in Seville are kind of 70 in Salamanca. But in Spain, we don't have any access to any civil register. So we were right. We only knew that they were living in Santa. But for example, in Seville, it's like, seven, it's like San Francisco. You have to find a central area in San Francisco, but you don't know anything about them. So, so you have the uh, social security records and we don't have, we didn't have anything. Well, we don't have anything. So what do we do? Well, the joke is that, I'm gonna read, the joke is that the sample is not simple. Yeah. So it was like snowball, we found one and we asked them if they knew another one. We were mailing, calling the nursing homes, checking the press, checking TV. It was like, um, uh, like I don't know how to say in English, like, like step by step uh, sampling. But and with, with, it was very difficult because sometimes to contact the, um, the centenarian, the, fam the relatives uh, told you to can go next week. We are in front of the house and the, the daughter or whatever uh, goes down and uh, she or he told us, sorry, she died yesterday, she died this morning. Yeah, it happened three times. Uh, but for their probabilities and chances are for there. Okay. Anyway, we have got for the moment a sample of 23 fully cognitively functional centenarians, 18 female, 5 male, and we did uh, up the data in two ways. It's a brief questionnaire about health. You can see the, the, the the topics and the most important one was the biographical interview uh, with a duration of 60 between 60 and 90 minutes to a centenarian. We have to have in mind that they have okay, they are one hundred or four years old. Um, the range was like uh, 30 and two and a half hours. Uh, yeah, some of them are like stronger than me for sure. And we got the other narratives of the centenarians. But uh, we didn't want to know how was their life like uh, working wherever or when I was a uh, child, I went to the school. No, we, didn't, we, we wanted to know how they feel about their own, their own longevity. We wanted to know how they, how were their attitudes toward, uh, towards uh, the most traumatic events in their lives. We wanted to know how they feel about the nearness of the death. So we wanted that. And it's kind of difficult because usually people don't talk about that. And usually a uh, centenarian don't talk to a stranger about that. And we were like in people in our 20s or like in our 30s and we were strangers in their houses talking about their most, their, their deepest uh, feelings. 
but we did it, kind of. Well, of course, the sample in Seville, most of them women, and most of them living with caregivers or relatives, and in Salamanca, the same, but most of them were living in nursing homes. A difference between the provinces because the geography, the geography. And uh, these were the topics uh, we talked. Mainly, we were interested in the first one, conceptual of old age and the longevity, and the sources of frustration and happiness, and the, uh, the meaning of life, and skip and bed. And it was a question actually uh, how do you feel about the other of your bed? What, what, uh, in Spanish, is or smooth. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And did you change the age? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I skipped that. Um, after we contacted the, the relatives or, or the, the centenarians, we checked in the civil register that they were actually 100 years old. So you don't have access to the register, but if you have the name of the person, you can go to the civil register and ask uh, for for the for the birth certificate. Yeah, how many things kind of weird? But most of them, I think like 95% of them were, were, were actually centenarians. And really check the birth certificate. Yeah, they were alive. Yeah. Did you have many refusals? People that you yeah, approached? Yeah. Yeah. But not for the centenarians, for the relatives. Because we were recording with the video cameras and and we're like three people there. I'm gonna talk to you. I'm gonna tell you about that. But like, I think like 30 percent, 35 percent of the fusion, probably. It's not too much. Yeah, not too much. But we have, we have, we have uh, that beside the death, some other kind of refusal. Um, sometimes it wasn't the relative, it was the nursing home because they didn't want to have people in. Inside the nursing home. Right, so. Anyway, I'm going to go very fast about this because it was up more to the students, like um, for an interview for the uh, interview at Centenarian. Like, I was pretty good at the Centenarian has uh, put many barriers because they are all very old and we are very young and we want to know about them and uh, about their feeling. So, I'd like to say in my, in my kids that these interviews are like a conqueror of resistances, like you have to defeat the barrier. And it's very difficult. It takes a lot of, a lot of time to, to go deeper and deeper, deeper and deeper into the, the feelings of the center. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, so what we do to, what, what did uh, we do to, in the interviews? Well, uh, we try always to go to the residence of the centenarian, as normal. Uh, most of them have some mobility impairments. With permission, we record the video, the, um, the, the interview, always uh, with the audio. And two important things also talk to the, the students. Sorry, I'm yes, not changing intermediate. And, but, we usually went to interviewers. One of them uh, was active, and uh, he or she was fully 100% interviewed <coughs> because, uh, although we have a we have a we have a, a very specific line, uh, the the narrative of the centenarian is always jumping. It's like you ask where um, they jump wherever they want. So it's very difficult to follow and um, to, to feed off of, of, the, of the topics of the brain. So um, they have um, some uh, hearing impairments, you have to be like uh, always uh, yelling at them, shouting. Uh, it's kind of uh, comfortable because like, uh, you are yelling at uh, the guy. <laughs> and um, um, they are asking always for that they have these hearing impairments. And so the active, the active one was like fully, fully dedicated to the, to the interview. And there was a, a passive one where it was like checking if all the topics uh, were clear, checking 
the non-verbal communication, um, just looking at the place because the, the, the house is uh, give us uh, a lot of information, checking how the relatives uh, were like, behaving, and that. And actually, if possible, we will always have a third interviewer, interviewer, a third person that is recording and taking pictures uh, back up. Um, and in the interviews, there were always expert, external people. The cousin, the niece, the daughter, two daughters, uh, three daughters, uh, social worker, the director. It was like there was an interview in Spain that uh, is a Spanish uh, journalist that interviewed the Nicolas Maduro, the president of Venezuela. It was the it was an interview how we watch it in at the TV and. This was the actual interview. Mm -hmm. So our interviews were like that. And for the centenarian, it's not so easy to focus on that person. Uh, it's true. We were in an interview, it was like 11 people in a small room. Like, but the real interviews like this. Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> yeah, there is the camera, the interviewer, this one is Alberto de Rey. I don't know if you know him. He was here. Twenty years ago, um, the, the recorder, the other interview was like over there, so it's more simpler and more comfortable. Um, I wanted to show we were in, we were like showing off. We were on the Andalusian TV showing the project and in in in, in the. Uh, in the TV, we showed how we performed the, the interview. I'm gonna skip it uh, at, the, at the end if we have time. I can show you just 30 seconds. And, uh, was, was the, the, the time? Two minutes. Um, the strategy, oh, yeah, the, yeah, the strategy is to, um, to get information. It's the usual in, in Tensing and Lincoln 101. Uh, many sciences, clarifications, certificates, simulation, empathy, and listening. But I would like to focus in the sciences. When I, I'm talking to anyone, if I know. Uh, I ask you, are you happy? You have to think about that at least three or four seconds. Or why are you happy? For me, I have to think like three, four, five seconds. But for a centenarian, any questions is like wait for a silence of um, 15 seconds. 10, 15 seconds. So you ask, and if you are not patient, you don't get anything. Our first inter interview was like, we were like, he's not, she's not answering. But we learn to be patient. And so like 15 seconds of silence is like, ah, no. But after these 15 seconds, maybe they talk like two minutes. So we, in, 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 as we were doing the interviews, we were learning how to perform better and better at the interviews. Uh, at the end, like we have like two masters of centenarian inter interviews because mm -hmm. some of my students were like the best. Like they were <laughs> empathic with the centenarians, with the women, with men, it was like really good. And um, a lot of clarifications, repeat the questions like twice, Maybe at the, for example, the traumatic events, it's a difficult question, so it's good to have it at the, at the beginning. They change the subject to something happy, and then at the end, repeat it again, when they are more confident with you, more comfortable. It usually is the same as, it's the, it, it is the same answer, but well, better to. Um, oh, don't listen, but that's not true. Well, the results. Preliminary results with um, uh, with these uh, 23 centenarians. The common pattern in longevity extreme is like the usual uh, factors: mm, continuous physical and mental activity. They were uh, working until now, Sorry, until they were hungry, working, doing something. One of them, for example, uh, no, I'm not sure. Really. Um, and they were reading until now. They were making cross 
was until now. They were always doing things until they could. Always. Since they were children. Uh, I used a normal thing is longevity. It's not uh, like a wow result. But mm, it was also the resiliency to traumatic events, like mainly among women. Uh, they have, like everyone spent in, in those cohorts, uh, the traumatic events, like war, and relative, the death of relative, starvation. That's not too, too, too new. They have strong family so social networks, uh, no risky behavior, geographical mobility, they run the rate, But the kind of new thing was like for women, for women in, the, uh, in Spain with a dictatorship, uh, that uh, with a, a strong patriarchy, uh, they were workers with a salary even after they got married, uh, uh, before they got married, and after they got married. It's not a normal, a, a common thing in Spain. Um, they were also entrepreneurs. Most of them had like a shop or uh, enterprise, small enterprise. Um, so that's like, and they were, uh, they had a um, modest um, um, background. So they, they went like a uh, very small, almost all, I think like 95% were, were very humble. So that was the new thing. But the newest thing was like, the, what, there were some differences by the end of that. Two results about the emotional health. Uh, first, the future, future expectations for their life. We were asking them, well, and what do you expect for your life on, onwards? Uh, um, and they said, well, I want to, if I am, like now, if I have health, if I, have, if I can walk, if I have no dependency, I have, I have no disabilities, I would like to reach more and more years. But, but, uh, he told us if it became worse, I would like to, to die. It was like, I, I would like to die. I, I don't want to be a burden for my family. I prefer to die and be, um, no, and, than be a burden for my family. But when we repeat like this, this question, we repeat it like three times because it was a good one. Um, analyzing the discourse of the centenarian, of the centenarian, we think that uh, they wanted to live, they wanted to live, but they didn't want to die. Um, and they, they wanted to be, don't, don't be, don't be forgotten, they wanted to be below, was like, and above all, they wanted to be consider, considered as a more personal child. Again, we do with our parents with 20 years. And about the longevity, uh, of course, it, it was unexpected. And they were happy to live so many years, and they were very humble. They feel like I'm lucky, I can have privileged one, but well, I, I, I don't mind if I have, if I am 100 or I am 80 or whatever. I just want to be below. I want to. I just want to be with my family. Um, I just want to be valued in my family, in my social networks. Um, I don't mind about if I'm centenarian, even uh, if they know they were like special, but uh, they didn't care too much. And there were some contradictions between past desire and between to die and to live. It was like, I want to die, I want to live, I want to see my granddaughters and go to the college. Or, or, but I want to die, but I have pain in my shape. <laughs> Well, um, further research, a lot of things. In this sample, we have some more compared to our urban areas. And, and the main one is we are going to perform a longitudinal study with a full work of four years. If I, we got the grant, I hope so, and I think so. Uh, but this one is going to be really good with uh, medical staff, nurses, probably like. A big, big one thing, uh, I guess. I hope. And um, to finish, I would like to make an homage 
to these center areas because they were so kind, the families were so kind to uh, giving, giving us the, the opportunity to, to go to the places. And we have here Antonia, uh, 108, was the second oldest one in, in Andalusia at, the, at that moment. She died when, yeah, a month ago. Uh, she was, uh, she's conscious, she's a uh, neighbor, my neighbor, in like 50 meters, in feet, like 115 feet. Um, in, he, in her 100th birthday, uh, the family gave her a cruise in the Mediterranean Sea, mm -hmm. and she went to, to see the Pope, and through, and they were like audience to the Pope. Uh, <laughs> Lucrezia, Lucrezia is 130, what? Well, she looks like 80, it's like, <laughs> but, 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 and Lucrezia, she's a big fan of Sevilla Soccer Club, and she went to the executive board, <coughs> with the president of the, of the team. Um, this one is the first one who interviewed uh, Elena. She died as well. Um, it was curious because she died and she was the grandmother of a uh, worker at the university. And she died, and one week later, uh, the family put uh, the, um, the house on to, to sell or sell. Yes, sell or sell. Yeah. So it was like we are waiting for so we want to give her like the best because it was a house like I don't know, like this uh, this building, not bigger. And it was Rosario it was a funny story, it was a creepy story actually because she almost died um during the interview. Um because she got a hot uh, shock because it was really hot in the nursing home. It was like it was in one of the hottest towns in Spain and it was really hot, really hot. And she was I, I can't, I can't breathe. And the interviewer was like, well, wait, wait, don't die. I want to ask you something here. How do you think about your 100? What do you think about your day? It's recorded. Yeah. And these are our male centenarian, Paco, Juan Frank. This one, a very funny story because we went to the town. And uh, we asked, uh, there was a guy like plowing the field. Uh, we asked him, sorry, do you know some guy here in the town? Because it's a town of 10 people. So, do um, you know some guy here who is uh, 100, 101 years old? I said, of course, it's me. <laughs> no, it was plowing like, yeah. Actually, the interviewer was uh, sitting in the chair. <laughs> and he was, uh, he, lived, uh, he lives alone. And he, he has his own field and he eats everything he, um, he grows. So, and Paco is another funny story because he was in a ship in, when the Civil War started and he didn't know <laughs> which position <laughs> to uh, take because you know, the Civil War was uh, the National and the Democrat, you say, and she, she, he didn't know. And he, he, he didn't know yet because he was in the ship during the three years of the <laughs> of the war. And time passes. Time goes by for everyone. Paco, national services. Uh, it's fun uh, friends. Same face. Same face. Yes. Uh, Pilar, happiest moment in her life when her uh, spouse died. Um, no. She told us. <laughs> um, Nati, uh, she suffered sexual harassment in the 30s, in the 1930s, with the minister of Franco. So it was like, and he slashed him, and the minister was a party. It was like, what she told I don't know where the real, no memories. So thank you, Rain. I hope you like it. Thank you, Juan. Yes, appreciate it. Um, you know, okay, so, so when you're describing these small samples that you get to when you're saying what's special about them, um, 
how do you think about that? I mean, you're not, there's no comparison group. Um, I mean, you're, you're coming from a background of more population research, so how do you think about doing a small sample describing them and then making conclusions about what may be special or not about this group? Yeah. So you mean that it's a small sample, so it's difficult to get uh, questions or? Well, uh, they are uh, better, they are more resilient than whom? Mm -hmm. uh, who's, okay. You say more resilient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, more yeah, resilient yeah, yeah. than whom is the idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's obviously some idea that the people who didn't live so long no, they yeah, were less yeah. resilient. But yeah. how, so how, how do you, how yeah, do you think about this? Yeah, it's according to other studies. Yeah. So because we, we haven't interviewed any other people less than 100 years old. But we want to do that in, in the longitudinal study with our own response. So, yeah, there is like, um, I mean, this project has so many limitations, and we know that. Um, and the, the strong point is that it's difficult to get the sample and difficult to get the interview. But, yeah, yeah you're right. I, 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 so we have, we have concluded with the, the, the results. Results of other sites, and we would like to compare with the um, interviews with people of non-Aginari and people in, in the same in the same provinces. It seems so, like the other approach that one could take with such a small group is to look at the variation within the group and try to kind of describe the types, not necessarily the frequency. Yeah. But you probably have people who are not happy to be so old. Mm -hmm. They may not be the majority. Yeah, right. Sure. And then to try to tell yeah. the story of the yeah. even the very small number of people what what yeah. it is about what you can piece together about them not being yeah. happy yeah. or 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 maybe that, that, that yeah those poor us who doesn't who don't want to be interviewed I don't know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but also even in your group yeah. you must have variation there, there is actually there is variation but there is like I I I have I have presented. Like the majority of the, mm -hmm. of the I, there are people like uh, we use that I, some people want some want to die actually and they don't want to live anymore that they want really that because they, they are not uh, in good health or whatever so maybe of these twenty three five of them yeah uh, yeah I think we need more more more. It's a sample um, because with 23 fine variations, so it's uh, I don't. I mean, my push would not be to increase the sample, but rather to figure out what you can do with these very special 23 people yeah. that you were able to get. Because one could always increase the sample. One yeah. Could but, but, you know, we, yeah. we have to go deep in the analysis of the narratives. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Can you just tell us what was the most exciting or surprising thing that you found? No, I mean, not the drone guy. I, suppose. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think, um, for example, uh, Paco, he was showing us how uh, he played when he was a child, and he was like doing exercises. Like, mm -hmm. People were jumping off me, it was like, mm -hmm. uh, very really, in a very good shape. It was like because all almost all of them had some mobility difficulties and it was like in a very good shape, apart from the, the flower. Um but I think and the moment when the, the, the lady almost died, it was like yeah, it was <laughs> it's it's kind of creepy and funny because it was like the guy asking us to do a but I, I trained them very well. <laughs> uh, and first time we, our first interview was like, like the first time, you know, actually. Yeah, you remember the most. And the, the lady was like, yeah, she invited us to have a, I to say, the, 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 the meal between the lunch and the dinner, do you want to? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> okay, <laughs> Yes, please. So 
wondering if you could tell us some more about resilience and how you're conceptualizing that. It, it's something that you know here at National Institute of Aging keeps talking about yeah. resilience and adaptation. And we have these prospective surveys like HRS and, and a couple of quantitative questions they, they try to characterize this and see if it's predictive. Yeah, so from this long, rich survey, I and mean, how are you thinking about it? Yeah, yeah, it's like emotional. I, I don't know what the hell is that, is that mm -hmm. actually. And resilience, like it, it's saying in Spanish, uh, resilience is like some new word and it doesn't fit it much with the, uh, our language. We say the most resistant, 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 thanks. So, yeah, we, we have to conceptualize according to the usual thing, like you are resistant to, or you are a better attitude to uh, get over of the, the traumatic event. Uh, we have to go in, we have to live in, in the post-traditional emotional health uh, resilience and what is a traumatic event, what is, a, what is happiness, what is a uh, desire to live or to, to, be, to die. I, 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 mean, I find it interesting this kind of talking about these people being so resilient, but one more health shock and then they would want to die. <laughs> yeah. That's sort of the, the opposite of what you think of as someone who just can adapt to an entire You know, we, we ask, then I the, um, what do they think about the proximity of death um, or, or about the expectation of their lives? First time we ask, they say, oh, I want to die, I want to die. Second time, well, I'm not so bad. Third time, well, I'm gonna live three or more years. So the first thought is I want to die. Because I guess probably they are complaining about their family. Mm -hmm. And then when you go and get, get Actually, they didn't want to. So maybe that's the resilience. Where uh, I don't know. Yes, it's very preliminary. There, I have been doing the analysis of the data sets in this in this month, so I have to go get with the other people of the team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. So I don't think about resilience when I'm looking at when I that statement about one more thing and I want to die. Is is that as one gets older, there's constant steps down in, in capability. I was noticing my father no longer, 97 almost, can no longer walk a single step, like curb the thought, right? And that wasn't true a while ago. And I think at that point, we start thinking about this lack of decline when you look in front of you, you're afraid of it. Once you're there, that's where resilience is. You adjust to this new reality. That's my thought. Mm -hmm. But I, I was wondering, again, in watching, I didn't know a hundred year old person in the bond. Um, and watching the these very older people that I've been being around with is that I, and I want to see if you've seen this in your results, is that I know some of you have, yet to be physically active, mentally active. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me you need something meaningful to do in your life, yeah. that your presence on earth matters. And then I have one which is you should have friends who are a lot younger than you. <laughs> because as you get really old, your friends die. And at some point, like once you're around 95, 90 to 95, you are the only person in your friendship that's yeah. alive. And while your kids, if you have kids, may be helpful, there's nothing like a friend. So I'm, do you see any of that in your in your work? Yeah, no, no, it's not, you're absolutely right. Yeah, that, so, uh, people, uh, these, these centenarians always want to do something to uh, get uh, to be active. Actually, all, all of them um, were about reading, example, about reading. Uh, some of them, they were reading uh, uh, Tolstoy and like this very cool novels. Um, or oh, Agatha Christie or whatever. Um, like three or no, no, five or six, uh, they started to paint. Um, or they were swimming, they were, and they started to make new friends at the nursing homes, or they started to make new friends uh, through the caregiver. Uh, so they, they, they wanted to be a, a more active, that uh, they can. So yeah, yeah. I, 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 as I, we, we saw that, so that, that those are, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, wait, sorry. Do, do work first. Yes. Okay. Um, so I was wondering, so it seems to me one of the like, like really valuable parts of this study is that you learned a lot about how to do these certain surveys and how to ask about some of these things. Have you thought a little bit about um, maybe like how to write that up or how that might inform more structured interviews that are trying to capture some of the things that people well, that can do how they ask you questions about these buildings or something? Yeah. Yeah. But it seems like a really valuable part of this yeah. learning how to ask these yeah. Well, the outlines, the interviews were like, it, it's very structured. And we have the same questions because, because they, they are asking to the you know, people. Um, the brief questionnaire is, uh, yes, it's a questionnaire, it's the same. So, so we are performing like the same interview with all of them. But sometimes we don't get all the information we really. Because you know, it's like any interview, people talk about they want to talk. Uh, uh, but they, they are, well, actually, we have like uh, four out outlines, like a big one with uh, questions, questions, like a small one, like a practical one. And we, we only use the, the, like the practical one, like uh, after. So we change the outline like three or four times after each interview. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The other thing is like, yeah, to give more structure, we can. It's not so easy to get the information, given the structure of line here. Yeah. In, in terms of the, the, the research output that your papers you're planning to write, are you going to write yeah. a paper like I just suggest about how to interview? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You actually have a, on my day, on my, like, outline the historical paper about how to interview. So yeah, we're, we're past one, so people have to go to the go, and we can, can take questions for a few more minutes. My question is a little similar. I was curious to know about the strategies, which ones do you find uh, were the hardest or the easiest yeah. to put into practice? I think hardest to wait, to wait until the they answer. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a 15 seconds. So try to try to talk to someone and wait for 15 seconds until you get an answer. This it's, it's a lot, it's really it's a lot. 10 seconds is a lot. Um, I, I actually I teach uh, I taught a seminar about this uh, like three or not three uh, time it goes by yeah like <laughs> nine months ago and it was like how to introduce and was like the, 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 the how to manage the, the sciences and and how to get the information because if you uh, make a questions like uh, yes yes or no questions it's very difficult to to get uh, any new information because they like people like I ask answer to you I said yes if you repeat the question again say, oh yes I just told you. So you have to avoid the uh, yes no questions. Actually, it's not too good to make a, a layered questions. It's like a graph work. Um, can you generalize a little bit about the experience of your research assistants? Your uh, yeah, they were in their twenties. Yeah, my experience is that, that young people are utterly terrified of people. <laughs> yeah, and I'm curious if if there was a noticeable change in did they, what did they get out? You mean the scenarios or the interviews? The, 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 the At the beginning, well, they were scared. Like I mean, when I people there, they, they were they were scared in the undergrads in in their last course. So they were very scared. Yes. They were like, performing an interview to a very old people to say, "You don't usually that." But after two or three interviews, or no, but in the second interview, they were like upset and, and they, they felt um, empathy with the, because they thought it's like my grandma, it's like my grandpa. So, so it was a good training for them. Actually, I, 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 I'm not very good at interviewing. <laughs> so I have my, my minions. <laughs> Uh, but, but they, they were, at the end, they were really happy. Like, they wanted to, I, 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 
interview, I want to go to, I know, 200 kilometers away to maintain the stones. It was like, actually, I have been, uh, I have, I had like seven students with me, and it's me excuse, I'm gonna have like four more. So people are very interested in that. Uh, and for, on the other hand, the centenarians at the beginning, yes, I know, projecting the, the, the young, the young students, but uh, like, I mean, it's comfortable because we are, like, we are, we train. Mm -hmm. Actually, it, it, but if I don't know who, who has said that, the train, we, we have a training. Like, we were like, training how to ask. But, but, we couldn't uh, do the training with um, actual centenarian. Why? Because without yeah. so many people, so it was a training with something like, I do tell your grandma, your grandpa, or whoever. Uh, so the, the actual training was with in the actual interview. That, so, that, so the training of interviews like it's very it's common, but not with this special population. Just one more, one last question. In the beginning of your talk, you were kind of a geographical uh, difference, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. There are these patterns potentially emerging, but there's more concerns in the north than in the south. Um, yeah. Do you have any hypotheses about that, or did you find anything in your interviews that would potentially? Well, I think in the north there are more centralians because they have a higher chance. Say, yeah. and maybe the rural context helps for that uh, healthy lifestyle probably. And we didn't perform yet any analysis of the differences between the north and the south. Because when we wanted to perform new interviews in the north north in Galicia, you know it's like Seville is in the south, Salamanca is in central Spain, in Galicia is in the north. Okay, we are doing interviews now yeah? we are have like seven or eight more. And we want uh, they are very very rural like most of the of the towns are like ten people, five people, six people. So we don't have yet any hypothesis about the behavior of the centenarians. Of the number of centenarians, like, that it has been a yeah, well typical. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.